Hi, um, my name is Matthias Goertz. Uh, I've been asked by some people to give a, a brief summary of the main points I'm making in my recent uh, November COVID-19 update, which is uh, quite a lengthy video. Um, so I've been asked to maybe give a 10 minute uh, summary. Um, I will try to do that. Um, I am uh, not sure I will stick exactly to 10 minutes, but I'll, I'll give it a try. <clears throat> to that purpose, I will share my screen with you. So here we are, Global Winter was the title. Um, this is the short uh, summary. Five points, really. Uh, firstly, um, we are in uh, what I call a fractured world, uh, which is one of four scenarios I and a uh, few colleagues um, designed in March and have been tracking ever since. Um, the fractured world is the scenario in which uh, COVID-19 has turned out to be uh, rather uh, moderate in its uh, severity as a disease, yet uh, our global responses to it have turned out to be uh, rather ineffective. Uh, so we are now in a, in a paradoxical world in which the virus is actually uh, far less harmless than we may have feared to, to start with. Um, and at the same time, the global responses have been, frankly, quite um, shocking and disappointing overall. Um, <clears throat> and in no, in, no, uh, in no relation any longer to the actual risk that uh, <clears throat> COVID may, may pose. Um, that's the first point. Secondly, uh, I have been contending that SARS-CoV-2 uh, is in fact a common cold coronavirus or certainly behaves very much like a common cold coronavirus of which you may know we already have four uh, you know, until last year and since late last year um, we now have five. So that's all that's happened in the last 12 months is that instead of four uh, common cold coronaviruses in our normal uh, cocktail of uh, cold viruses, there are over 200 viruses in that cocktail that we regularly are exposed to as humans. In so in addition to the original four, we now have five. That's it. That's all that's happened. Uh, so why, uh, you would ask, why are people dying? Because normally we are not dying of the cold. Uh, and the answer to that is most likely uh, because the virus is new. Um, it's not per se dangerous or any more dangerous than other cold viruses probably, but it is new. And it's, 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 it's a risk to some people just by virtue of being new. Being new means it's new to our immune systems. Our immune systems don't have a prior blueprint or memory of this particular virus. They may have useful blueprints and uh, memories of similar uh, coronaviruses, which may help to some degree for many people to actually mount a very effective immune uh, response, but we don't have a blueprint unless we've been infected by this one for the specific uh, SARS-CoV-2. And uh, that just means the immune system, when it's confronted with the virus, meaning when we are being infected, um, takes some time uh, to, to mount a response. And because it takes some time to mount a response, <clears throat> the virus um, can colonize our upper respiratory system uh, rather well before our immune system really fully responds. And unfortunately, in about 1% uh, or so of all cases, the virus gets past the upper respiratory system and down into the lung or into the lower respiratory tract. And it is down in the lung that it becomes uh, dangerous because it will colonize the alveoli, which is the places where oxygen exchange takes place in the lungs. 
and that basically means the pneumonia and the pneumonia can be uh, very risky and fatal especially for elderly people and that explains why uh, it is predominantly elderly people or people with certain preconditions uh, health health or medical preconditions that are affected by severe symptoms 99% of humanity from our calculations have no symptoms at all when they get infected or they have mild symptoms which are basically a cold so 99% of us either have nothing or we have a cold so we're not really sick only 1% have uh, severe symptoms meaning they are sick and they need to get hospitalized uh, and of those uh, 1% maybe about uh, one fifth uh, die so maybe the infection fatality ratio is 0.2%, if not lower. The seasonality that we're currently seeing is um, therefore no surprise at all. And in fact, it, um, it reinforces the impression that this is a common cold coronavirus because already now the, this virus seems to have um, joined, if you like, the normal Northern hemisphere uh, uh, flu and cold season that we're now entering. So it's already learned in those 12 or maybe slightly more than 12 months that it probably has been with humans. It has already learned, uh, you know, to adjust to that seasonal cycle that we normally go through. So in, in the summer in the Northern Hemisphere, it kind of goes slow. And then come October or so, um, you know, the, uh, the, the activity rises. So that's what we're seeing right now, especially in Europe and but also North America and, you know, generally in the Northern Hemisphere. So that, uh, that um, seasonality we are seeing now reinforces the argument that this virus either is or at least behaves very much like a common cold coronavirus. It has all kinds of implications, mostly very positive ones for us. Namely, most likely, once you've had this virus once, the likelihood that you will ever get seriously sick of the virus when we get reinfected, and we, we will then therefore get reinfected because that's the case with all uh, uh, the common cold viruses that we don't, our body does not bother to keep antibodies against it after, after infection, to keep antibodies against it for very long, maybe a few months. The same maybe with T cells, maybe six months or more, but uh, maybe even a year or maybe two, but not for not forever, uh, because it's very costly for the body to keep antibodies and, and, and cells ready for virus that is actually harmless. Um, our immune system is way too efficient to, you know, to bother doing that, right? And uh, so it will keep some uh, antibodies uh, ready for a few months. Presumably that means we will not get the same infection twice within the same uh, season. So if you've been infected this winter, you will not get infected by the same virus a second time this winter, but you may get reinfected next winter. Um, so it will just become part of that normal cycle of, of cold uh, uh, viruses that go around. And you know all of us will get infected and all of us will get reinfected, um, but uh, the, the presumption is that once we've gone through the first infection, whether it was, uh, whether we had uh, severe symptoms or not, most likely will never again really be at risk, um, you know, of having severe symptoms, uh, maybe exceptions. Um, there was one case reported where someone was infected a second time and actually the second time had more severe symptoms than the first time. So those cases apparently do happen, but um, I would contend they will be the exception rather than the rule. So the good news would be if, if we believe this to be a common cold uh, coronavirus, then it will, once we've all been through this once, it will become pretty harmless pretty pretty soon. And we, in, a, in, a, in a while, two, three years from now, we'll, we'll have forgotten about it because it's just become a normal part of our daily lives. Uh, at the moment, it's, um, its fatality rate is higher than that of uh, seasonal flu, and it's comparable roughly to that of a pandemic flu, meaning new influenza strains that we're also not familiar with. So it's a similar uh, situation. So the, the IFR is comparable with those. Um, but 
presumably then in, 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 in a few years, the IFR of SARS-CoV-2 will actually be lower than that of uh, seasonal influenza because seasonal influenza kills not only some elderly with compromised immune systems, but also some very young uh, newborns or infants whose immune system is not yet fully developed. That does not, the second case does not happen with SARS-CoV-2. Apparently uh, the young ones, the very young ones have no difficulty with this virus, which is very good news. And again, it's consistent with uh, common cold viruses, which also are very rare to affect uh, young ones, right? So we can probably expect, yes, there will always be some elderly people with compromised immune systems who, you know, who will get a pneumonia, whether it's from SARS-CoV-2 or whether it's from some kind of mixture, a cocktail of cold viruses, or whether it's from the influenza viruses that go around. That will always be there and we will not be able to fully prevent that from happening. And pneumonias are always risky for um, elderly people, um, or almost always, or often anyways. Um, so that will not go away, but the prediction here is that probably it will not, the, the, the general level of that uh, happening will not increase in any kind of measurable or significant way, just because we now have five instead of four uh, common cold coronaviruses. So, in short, in the, in the medium term, two, three years down the road, when we've got through this, um, there will no longer be a problem. Uh, the problem is there here in the here and now, because at the moment, there are still a lot of people out there who haven't been uh, exposed to the virus yet and who may have a uh, uh, compromised immune system and therefore are at risk. So there are at risk groups that we need to be mindful of and that we need to support and protect. Um, third point, um, instead of, yeah, instead of doing that, which is understanding who are the at-risk groups and how we can most effectively uh, uh, protect them, um, most governments, with a few exceptions, have chosen to pull out a hammer, a big sledgehammer, in some cases, really a bulldozer and turn their countries upside down and put them into uh, what is called a state of exception. That's a, 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 a term from political theory that arose out of the early fascism uh, and Nazism in the 1920s and uh, has been used by Giorgio Agamben, an Italian philosopher, to, to, um, you know, to talk about situations in which sovereigns, uh, usually states, transcend the rule of law in the name of uh, doing good to the public or protecting the public. Uh, and we are now deep into the state of exception in which the governments have suspended numerous uh, basic rights and liberties of people in the name of we must fight the virus. We don't fight common cold viruses. <laughs> That's nonsense. <laughs> Your governments are basically telling you nonsense. Um, but that's where we are at the moment. And that's what our scenario, uh, fractured world, really describes. A world in which we have a, a virus that is harmless for almost all people with the exception of about 1% of the population whose immune system is uh, compromised and who need protection. Uh, and on the other hand, a global response that has put much of the world into what seems to be a fairly permanent uh, state of exception where our basic rights and liberties just simply uh, remain suspended and can be changed at will by governments at any time. And that's become the so-called new normal now. And all of that thanks to just, just the very plain vanilla virus. Um, now, one word on the vaccines. Everybody is sort of hoping that the vaccines will come soon and that they will simply uh, make the problem, so-called problem, go away. And a lot of governments have staked their reputation on that. The argument is, we need, we, we need the state of exception. Now they don't use that word, but that's what it is. We need the state of exception now um, to protect uh, those at risk. 
Um, and when the vaccine comes, everybody will be vaccinated and then everything is fine, yeah. Uh, and if the vaccines are available and they work well and they can be distributed rapidly, that, that is a possible scenario that, you know, things will be fine. But as I argue in my video, um, there are also other possibilities, at least, uh, you know, in the short term, nothing may change at all because if governments insist to use vaccines not only for those at risk, but also for the rest of the population, that's 80, 90% of the population, and if they insist that they will not go back to normal until all those 80 or 90% of the population have been vaccinated, so basically they use the vaccine to create what we call herd immunity, um, that may take many, many months, and we may not be through that by the end of next year, 2021, and you know, we may well be into 2022 or so, until that really has happened in many countries. So that uh, approach would mean we will remain in the state of exception easily for another one and a half or two years, uh, just because of the insistence that one must first get vaccinated before one can go back to normal. Right. Even in countries maybe where the natural progression of the virus is such that they, they already reach herd immunity uh, without the vaccine. Now, there are countries now not so far away from reaching 60 to 70 percent penetration. And, and I discussed that at, at length in my video. Um, there's even a possibility that the vaccines will lead to battles of uh, distribution uh, between countries that have access to the vaccine and countries that don't, or even within countries, if, uh, you know, if the vac if vaccination becomes a precondition for, you know, being able to enjoy the normal freedoms, uh, people will naturally line up to get vaccinated. And, you know, some, some people will be termed at risk and will get prioritization and others will not. And you can imagine that even within a society, fractures could arise uh, regarding who gets the vaccine first. And that, again, is not because the vaccine is so important to protect you from the virus, but the, the vaccine will be so important to give you your liberties back uh, if governments uh, make it so, right? So the vaccines can become, uh, you know, a bone of contention uh, that could be rather dangerous, right? In the worst case, what can happen is the vaccines don't come uh, at least not for the foreseeable future, and that's quite possible, maybe not the most uh, probable event, but it's possible uh, that none of these vaccines that are underway actually get, uh, get uh, uh, certified, at least not by credible agencies, um, and we don't have a vaccine, um, and governments nevertheless then say, well, then we stay in the new normal until the vaccine comes, even if that may take years. Now, if, if whole countries get remain locked up um, and remain in the state of, for example, suppressing the virus and, and preventing their people, uh, the population from exposing themselves naturally to the virus, two things can happen. One, uh, there, can be, um, there can be mutations of the virus in different locations. So if a country is completely locked up and doesn't open their border, over time, the virus that circulates within that country may become sufficiently different from the virus in the next country to potentially even, I mean, in the extreme case, no longer react to the same vaccine in the same way or, or to the same therapy. Um, so that's a real risk of a diversification and, and proliferation of variations, if not even uh, strains of this virus, where we originally had one, we may end up with many. Uh, and that will just increase complexity. They're not necessarily more dangerous, those new ones, but it's just increased complexity of, of, of handling these uh, virus and the vaccines and all, and the therapies and all that. So it will be government decisions that may lead to such a proliferation, namely governments being unwilling to just reopen the borders and, you know, have a single uh, type of virus circulating around humanity rather than multiple types. The other, the other risk of this scenario where there is no, um, there is no vaccine uh, for the foreseeable future, but countries nevertheless say we, we remain sort of in the new normal and suppress the virus, is that over time, I mean, we get older every day and our immune systems get older every day incrementally, but you know, they get older every day, meaning 
they get the likelihood that uh, they are not fully functioning increases every day, right? So put it another way, we all slowly nudge towards becoming ever higher risk. Uh, so if we are not allowed today to expose ourselves to the virus, but we, if we are forced by our governments um, to not be able, of, if we cannot expose ourselves to the virus for let's say years to come, we're just getting older and therefore the risk increases for everybody in the population. Or you, to put it another way, the, the IFR, the infection fatality ratio of the virus, instead of trending down and things getting ever better, thanks to therapies, et cetera, it will actually trend up. So government policy in the longer run, in the absence of a vaccine and with continued suppression of the virus will increase the IFR, the infection fatality ratio of this virus for everybody. Um, so vaccines could make things worse rather than making them better or at least before making them better. Uh, so we need to be mindful of that. Last point. Uh, I made is we could end this crisis now. We don't have to be in this crisis at all. It's a man-made crisis. We are deciding every day we like to be in this crisis. Uh, we don't have to consider this uh, virus a crisis at all. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I argued it's not clear that we should call this a pandemic if only 1% of the population get ill. Uh, because a pandemic usually is defined as uh, a large proportion of the population getting ill, which is not the case with COVID, a very small portion of the population uh, that are infected get ill. So whether it's even a pandemic, um, uh, it's, it's basically we're having, an, 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 of course, a significantly increased precedence uh, uh, instances of pneumonia. That is correct. And that's pneumonia, again, is, is, is potentially fatal. So I'm not trying to downplay the fatality of pneumonia. Uh, I'm just saying this is not anything new. We've always had pneumonias. We just, we have more of them right now just because there's a new version of virus and we are not yet attuned to it. So the quicker we can attune to it, the better. And uh, those people who are really at risk, above 60 or 65, let's say, let's give them the best uh, possible protection. And we could do that now because there's one uh, means of protection that is highly effective, not 100% for sure, but highly effective and it's immediately available and that's surgical masks. And I'm arguing in my video in detail why are surgical masks actually quite good to protect those People, why is it not necessary that everybody else wears the mask? It is actually quite sufficient for those people who feel at risk to wear the mask when they go into public places, if they actually comply and do it properly and wear it properly. Um, and also there are a whole bunch of other measures around these people, including rapid testing in their homes. If, 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 if an elderly lives together with the family and you know the kids, the, the grandchildren go in and out and uh, you know the, the middle generation, the parents go in and out and you know, they go about their normal life, um, you know, maybe they have to self-test, uh, uh, do, do a quick, you know, antigen uh, test or so every, every few days, right? But that's easily done. I mean, the logistics have to be sorted out, but all of that is possible and available today. So my argument in the video is we could protect those who feel that they are at risk uh, now, and we, we could do it quite effectively. I mean, not 100%, but quite effectively, and we could decide now to let everybody else just go back to their normal lives uh, with not, without problem, actually. It's quite feasible and it's quite, it's quite surprising and alarming that governments don't entertain that option at all, that they insist on keeping the, the whole world in a state of exception and keeping all our basic rights in, in suspension uh, even though it's absolutely not necessary in, 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 in uh, handling the virus in such a way as to protect those at risk and minimize fatalities until hopefully then the vaccines come and they can be phased in and they are certainly more convenient than having to wear a mask for, for those people at risk. Um, so we, we could end the crisis now and it is shocking. It is shocking that we're not actually doing that. And, you know, it is not surprising then that uh, people come up with all kind of wild theories. Why are governments acting the way they are? Is it just about their power or is it about governments not able to 
think through this uh, or what is, uh, what is the reason? So I, I think those questions uh, will have to be asked. And so my uh, video is, uh, is a small contribution to that. Um, now, one, one additional point I want to make that was not in the lengthy video um, because it just sort of came up. I had previously said that we are facing a double whammy. Namely, on the one hand, we are getting ever older, meaning all other things being equal, ceteris paribus, uh, uh, our immune systems will ever be ever, on average, be ever more compromised. And our ability to deal with uh, novel viruses that come our way will be trending down. Our ability to deal with them will be trending down over time as we get on average, ever older. That was the point I made before. And the second part of the double whammy I made before is that ever more viruses will jump over from um, mammals to humans as our share of the global biomass continues to increase, right? Because uh, there are ever more of us, we are also getting ever uh, bigger, massier, right? So we take up, up ever more biomass as humanity. And in parallel, we destroy, you know, uh, rainforests and, you know, ecosystems of plants and animals and destroy massive amounts of uh, biomass. Uh, we are adding biomass by then, you know, growing cattle or, or um, growing, growing uh, agricultural products on the same land area. But usually the biomass we destroy is a greater volume and diversity than the biomass we replace it with. So net net over time, uh, our human share of global biomass keeps increasing. That forces viruses who, as you know, um, have to replicate inside of plant or animal or human cells. They cannot uh, propagate otherwise. They, they depend on these cells. Uh, most of the millions of different types of viruses in the world live on plants and animals. Very few of them live on humans. But if we squeeze the, that whole biomass that they live on into some corners ever more, and we ourselves expand ourselves ever more, it is logical that they will have ever more need in order to survive to try to jump over to us. We will just become the favored host <laughs> for a lot of viruses, naturally, right? Um, and, but it's not naturally, it's man-made, it's our actions, uh, our destruction of the biosphere, um, and at the same time, our multiplication of ourselves will make it so. These viruses will try not to go away, right? They will try to survive and one way to survive is to come to us. And that's what they're gonna do. So we, I said the double whammy is we'll be ever more, ever more vulnerable to new viruses. And yet at the same time, there will be ever more new viruses that will try to come to us. Now, the other day we had this interesting report from Denmark where you know, they're calling um, uh, 15 or 17 million minks because they found that SARS-CoV-2 jumped over from humans in Denmark to the mink farms. Denmark is the biggest uh, farming country for minks, um, and uh, minks being a mammal, yeah. Uh, and uh, what happened then is the, the viruses jumped back from the minks back to the humans, um, which is not surprising. That's what they would do. If they can jump from a ma mammal to a human, then they probably can also run jump back from a human to a mammal and from that mammal back to humans, right? So you're getting this sort of a, a, a pendulum effect where the virus will uh, try to jump back and forth and colonize other mammals, especially now, now that's been successful with us, it will attack mammals that are close to us or that you know we are we are we are keeping uh, that are, we are domesticating. So the, the therefore the the observation here is that the more we are dependent on domesticated animals with whom we interact closely, the more you will get these instances of the virus going back and forth between uh, two species, humans and some mammal species, whether it's minks or it could be other mammals as well. Right? Any mammals that we have regular contact with could potentially be involved in that in that pendulum swinging uh, back and forth. Now that is um, important because 
when the virus jumps to another species, let's say a mink, even though, I mean, they can jump over because presumably it is uh, genetically uh, quite similar to humans, of course, um, but it is not exactly the same, right? So for the virus, it's a new ecosystem that has some different characteristics. Um, they adapt to that new e ecosystem, let's say the minks, and then maybe they mutate in the minks for a while and they become quite different, uh, let's say a new strain of SARS-CoV-2, and then they jump back to the humans, right? So what we gave to the minks is maybe the current strain uh, of SARS-CoV-2, but what we get back from them a while later, maybe a different strain, and it may be sufficiently different um, to no longer react in the same way to therapies and vaccines, for example. So we basically then have created a new, a new strain. Um, and that means this interaction between human and domesticated animals will work like an accelerator. It will just simply accelerate the, the multiplication of different strains of the same virus and different mutations. And again, mutations need not be dangerous for us. In most cases, they probably aren't. Um, you know, they're only relevant if they actually affect the, the phenotype of that uh, animal, right? But if they do and they jump back to us and they are actually more dangerous for us or they don't react to our vaccine, we will have additional complexity and risk. Um, so in addition to what I said earlier that closing borders increases the risk of proliferation of this virus, interaction with other uh, uh, mammals or other animals uh, certainly also increases that risk. In fact, it may be even increasing that risk even more because of this pendulum effect that goes back and forth. Um, all in all, uh, we will be exposed to novel viruses ever more frequently. And some of those novel viruses that will come our way in the future may not be as benign as you know, this current SARS-CoV-2. So the point I would like to leave you with um, is that we cannot afford such fits of madness as what we're going through right now every time some virus comes our way. It will happen frequently, ever more frequently. And the best we can do is, you know, first of all, be a little bit relaxed and understand that we have a first rate immune system and almost all of us do. Don't forget that almost all of us have absolutely no problem with SARS-CoV-2 as well as hundreds of other viruses. I mean, our immune system is extremely powerful. Second, that there are things we can do both on the macro level about our general uh, behavior on this planet in terms of do we really want to get ever older and older and are we willing to bear the cost of that? that there are benefits to it, but there are also costs to it. Are uh, we continuing to destroy the biosphere, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so there are bigger questions uh, that arise from this and there are also immediate things that we can do. Uh, for example, can we invest more in strengthening the immune systems of let's say elderly people as we all get older? Other things we can, you know, maybe put more money and research into than we have in the past. Uh, but other things can we do to be better prepared uh, for future viruses because they're, they're sure to come. Um, I think the most important though is to be mentally prepared. There, there's absolutely no benefit in panicking just because of whatever virus, even a much more fatal virus, panic, panic and thoughtlessness and overreaction and shooting from the hip and just closing borders and just putting people into lockdown without any kind of thinking just simply don't help. And if there's one thing we should take away from this current crisis in a positive way is let's not do that again. Let's not make all these mistakes we've now been making and continue to make. Let's never make those uh, mistakes again. That's, um, that's my uh, hope. And with that, I stop sharing my screen and uh, wish you all the best. And if you are interested in the details, please listen to my uh, lengthy video that I published last week. Thank you. Bye-bye.